As we've been reporting, Attorney General William Barr says he thinks the FBI spied on President Trump's 2016 campaign. Those comments made during Wednesday's hearing before the Senate Appropriations Committee drew mixed reactions from lawmakers on both sides of the aisle. I didn't hear the testimony, but here's the question for me. Was the counterintelligence intelligence operation against the Trump campaign legit? Was it based on credible evidence that the Trump Papadopoulos and anybody else was working with the Russians? Or did our own government or people close to our own government put that in his mind? Why didn't they brief the president? Let me just say how very, very dismaying and disappointing that the chief law enforcement officer of our country is going off the rails yesterday and today. He is the, the attorney general of the United States of America, not the attorney general of Donald Trump. Let's bring in Jackie Alemany. She's the author of the Washington Post's Power Up newsletter and a familiar face. She's a CBS News alumna. Great to see you, Jackie. Thanks so much hey, for joining Lynn. us. Thanks for having me. So great to see you. So uh, what and who uh, specifically is Attorney General Barr going to be looking at here? Well, that is a, a great question, uh, because, you know, as Nancy Pelosi just said, the attorney general brought up um, brought up an issue that was really litigated by his deputy attorney general, Rod Rosenstein, um, you know, last year. Uh, he, you know, Barr has made, made these accusations, which he provided no basis for, um, that there was improper surveillance, um, but then, you know, again, refused repeatedly to provide why he was making such an accusation, uh, and then circled back and said that it wasn't necessarily what he meant. But again, Rod Rosenstein, you know, who, who sits across the hall from him, actually, um, you know, reviewed and signed these FISA warrants uh, to, uh, you know, a year ago mm -hmm. that, that said that the surveillance um, was, was, was warranted. So we just heard reaction from Senator Lindsey Graham and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. What else are you hearing from lawmakers about the attorney general's comments and what they're looking for when the full version of Mueller's report is released? Yeah, well, I think what I'm a lot of what I'm hearing really is if that if the attorney general was looking, you know, to inoculate himself against claims of partisanship, he's not necessarily doing a good job between the way that he's handled the, the preliminary stages of the Mueller report, which is, you know, providing um, what a lot of people, especially Democrats primarily, have viewed as a partisan interpretation to um, you know, immunize the president from accusations of collusion uh, through his summary of the Mueller report to, you know, to these hearings the past two days where he appears to be defending the president. And so, you know, I think we are, of course, going to be seeing the report, hopefully, in, in full, although Barr has, uh, you know, specified what sorts of redactions are going to be made next week. Um, and I think what people are going to be looking for is sort of the differences between Barr's summary and what is actually in the report, um, which, again, is, is only a summary of the report and Barr's own partisan conclusions. Well, does all of this increase the likelihood that Robert Mueller will be called to testify before Congress, you think? Yeah, I, that seems to me to be um, pretty pre-baked to offer an ex, a full ex explanation um, over the process behind this entire report, which, you know, the country's really spent the last two years uh, focused on. Um, I think if potentially Barr had decided to release these preliminary summaries that, that Mueller's team, you know, leaked to The Washington Post and to The New York Times that they created and expressed frustration that Barr didn't release, then maybe it would be a different story. But I think because of the, um, the perception problem that Barr has created, there is, uh, I think, an overall desire for increased transparency and, and for Mueller to, to be summoned to testify and to, you know, explain why he wasn't able to make a conclusion himself on obstruction of justice and why Barr was. Well, so I want to play some of what President Trump had to say about this before leaving the White House on Wednesday. It was an illegal investigation, Major. It was an illegal investigation. It was started illegally. Everything about it was crooked. Every single thing about it. There were dirty cops. These were bad people. You look at McCabe and Comey, and you look at Lisa and Peter Strzok, 
these were bad people. And this was a, an attempted coup. This was an attempted takedown of a president. And we beat them. So he also said people involved in the Russia investigation were guilty of treason. And we heard the president bring up James Comey. I mean, does this not put a spotlight back on people like him, the former FBI director? Yeah, well, that's why I also think, you know, Attorney General Barr's comments today were a bit problematic, because they did invoke this uh, oft-repeated theme that the president tries to resort to of there being some deep state conspiracy around him, when the Mueller, uh, the special counsel and the need for a special counsel was actually, you know, very legitimate and grounded in, in facts. And at the end of the day, the report did find that Russia was actually trying to interfere with our elections, which is, you know, problematic in and of itself, and the president himself should be concerned concerned with our own election integrity, right? Um, but, of course, you're, you're going to hear the president make these extraneous accusations um, and try to, you know, it stretch Barr's conclusions as far as he can go. Of course, there has been reporting from The Post um, already that shows that even senior administration officials are concerned that the president might be taking this a bit too far, and that once the actual report does come out, there, there's going to be quite a bit of, uh, of a gap between the president's you know, um, self-proclamations about being, you know, completely uh, innocent versus what is actually in the report. Um, but, of course, you know, there has already been a few weeks for uh, this narrative to set in, which I think is what has concerned a lot of Democrats and, and members of Mueller's own team. Uh, let me ask you about another topic here. President Trump was in Texas Wednesday as the administration is moving toward a tougher immigration strategy. He called on Congress to help change immigration laws and said asylum rules are being taken advantage of. So, Jackie, remind us, what specifically does the president want changed here? Yeah, well, the, over the past few weeks, the president has thrown a number of policies, um, really, as, as we called it this morning, and been power up, a really a spaghetti on the wall approach, uh, from putting additional tariffs on to um, Mexico's uh, auto exports, uh, to forcing asylum seekers to actually stay in Mexico and not be allowed to cross the border, which, of course, a federal judge ruled um, against and said wasn't wasn't legal. Uh, and then, you know, there's also this um, by Binary uh, policy, this, you know, which is family separation policy 2.0, which the administration uh, and the White House is currently weighing, which would revert back to essentially um, separating families at the border in order to create a deterrent strategy. Um, but really, all that we've seen out of this actually, in terms of the data, is a spike in the number of families that have been surging the border and attempt attempting to illegally cross over into the U.S. Uh, let's turn to 2020 here. Vermont senator and 2020 Democratic presidential hopeful Bernie Sanders unveiled his Medicare for All proposal Wednesday. In recent weeks, President Trump has said Republicans will become the, quote, party of great health care. Do you see health care becoming one of the defining issues of the 2020 campaign? 100 um, percent. You know, actually, we interviewed Gary Cohn this morning, who told us that health care and Republicans' inability to defend uh, pre-existing conditions was political suicide in 2018. And if, you know, the president himself isn't able to uh, defend pre-existing conditions going into 2020, it's, it's likely to be a problem that's going to repeat itself, um, I think, you know, for the president and for all of the senators, uh, the incumbents that are also up for re-election right now. Uh, I think what Bernie has been able to successfully do is establish himself as the thought leader here. You know, this is something that he has been a proponent of for years now. Um, one question, though, that he was not able to answer that I think people have been looking for uh, is the cost of this, exactly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he it, some experts estimate that it could cost up to $30 trillion over 10 years, which, I guess, for the fiscal hawks in the Democratic Party, that's potentially problematic, also something that Trump is bound to um, exploit and, and repeat on the campaign trail. But I think what Sanders did accomplish and has accomplished is presenting an exact contrast to the president's um, ill-fated health care bill, which, you know, cut a lot of money from Medicare. Uh, and Sanders' Sanders's plan really presents the exact opposite. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit more about your interview with Gary Cohn. He also told you the administration's proposed cuts to Social Security would be, quote, political suicide. How is he taking on this issue? Yeah, it is really interesting, actually, to hear, you know, one of the chief architects of Trump's uh, tax reform plan, which offered, you know, 
trillions of cuts uh, to corporations and the wealthy, now talk about his new project of trying to save Social Security. He's a fellow at um, the Harvard Institute of Politics, and he's working with uh, the former um, North Dakota Senator Heidi Heitkamp on this project of trying to find trying to find a way to make Social Security solvent, mm. um, because by the year 2034, um, it is going to have totally exhausted the trust fund. So they're trying to find a way, uh, sort of crowd surfing the students, creating a—having a Shark Tank-esque competition mm. of a plan that can address this problem. Um, but, you know, Trump's budget uh, actually put, makes pretty, pretty dramatic billion-dollar cuts to Social Security and, and to Medicare and to Social Security disability insurance, mm. even though Trump promised on the campaign trail not to do so. Yeah. Of course, again, the irony that a lot of critics point out here is that uh, Gary Cohen and the president's tax reform plan places increased pressure on Social Security, right? right? Because right. this president's budget, um, a lot of people view as trying to, uh, you know, uh, um, overcompensate for the deficit that his tax plan um, caused. Mm. You know, there hasn't been as much revenue coming in. And this was a way, I think, that Mulvaney, the former Office of Management and Budget um, director, uh, wanted to pay, f pay for these changes. Um, you know, Cohn called this political suicide as well. But also made the point that, you know, this is just a budget, it's just a proposal, mm -hmm. um, and that he doesn't think it's going to, to pass, but pass, you know, through Congress, but really is just a way for the president to say, look, I tried to, to, to balance the budget and uh, Congress wouldn't let me do it. Wow, it's really interesting to hear him talk about this because obviously this has been really, Social Security has been such a third rail in politics for a, a really long time. All right, Jackie Alemany, thank you so much, Jackie. Great to see you. Thanks, Elaine. Great to see you too.